Hey, hi. I'm uh, Chris Drosanovich. I'm uh, one of the people who's been working on RISC V. I should give a shout out to all the, the major contributors, especially Andrew Waterman and Jens Sapoli, two of our grad students who uh, drove a lot of this, and Dave Patterson, who's in the audience, who's been working with me on this as well. There's a whole host of characters who've been helping with RISC V in the Aspire Lab. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, I start with a little aside here, which is uh, my first computer. Um, this is a picture of my first computer. Now in the UK, I ask people to guess what this is. I'll ask here, I don't expect anybody to know this. Um, now this was actually an Acorn Atom. So it came out before the BBC Micro. There's a 6502 base machine. And there's two reasons I'm telling you about this machine. Um, one is that it was open source. And you bought the computer, you got the schematics, you knew exactly what was in there, made it very easy to program it, attach stuff to it, um, play with it. Um, the second reason, it's made by Acorn, and people have tried to cast RISC-V versus ARM as David versus Goliath. I find that pretty funny. The ARM guys think it's funny too, because they think they're David fighting the other Goliath, Intel. Um, but um, really, I just want to say a few things about ARM. This is kind of a disclaimer that you know they're a great company. Um, they produce, if they produce the IP you need, um, and if you can work out a license agreement with them in time, um, then you'd be crazy not to use ARM. But many projects don't fit into the above. And some people are just crazy. Um, so what is an ISA? Well, the first thing I should say about ISAs is they don't matter at all, right? ISAs are really, really unimportant in the grand scheme of things. And by that, I mean, if you look at um, the performance and efficiency of a system, um, most of it's due to other stuff, like the algorithm you use much bigger weight on how well a system performs than anything about the instruction set. How you code it, um, the compiler you use. There is a little effect from the ISA maybe, um, but the microarchitecture, the core design, the memory hierarchy, the circuit design, how good your design is at building these components, the physical design, how well did you do floor planning, um, the fabrication you use to build this thing, right? So Intel's got amazing fabrication technology. So in some sense, ISAs don't really matter if you look at performance energy efficiency, right? Um, and this is what some people wonder about. Why do we care about the ISA anymore? Because of all these other factors. But the reason that ISAs do matter is that um, it's the most important interface in a computer system. It's where hardware meets software. Okay? And um, there's a massive cost to port and tune all the ISA dependent parts of a software stack. Um, just one small example, ARM v8 still doesn't have a very effective JVM. right? So, um, and as well as that, there's all the stuff you don't expect, like the large cost of port and tune and quality assure, assure all the stuff that's supposed to be ISA independent. But turns out it isn't because all the other stuff usually has bugs in that are ISA dependent on that port. So there's a lot of work to bring everything over to a new ISA, okay? So given that, um, if the choice of ISA doesn't have much impact on the end system's energy performance, and it costs a lot to use different ones. Why is there more than one, right? Makes no sense that the industry has more than one ISA, right? So why is that, okay? Um, so we say no reason. There should be one ISA, should be free and open, should be standard just like ethernet, right? Just standard way you connect parts of the industry together, the hardware guys, the software guys. Um, so so why, is, why are we in a situation where there are multiple different ISAs? Well, it's basically historical and business reason. There's no technical reason for the lack of a free and open ISA. Um, it's not an error of omission. It's not like those guys at Intel and ARM um, just wake up one morning and say, oh, you know what we forgot to do? We forgot to make our ISA open. You know, it's like, you know, they wake up, oh, yeah, we'll go do that right now. You know, tax their underlings to go and make it open to everybody. They will actively go and sue you if you try and do an implementation of, you know, an Intel core or an ARM core or an IBM power or any of these other ISAs, right? They'll aggressively go after anybody trying to do an implementation uh, to that standard. So it's not that they just forgot to do this, right? They, they go out there and they get people who try and do this. Um, now, the other reason, why is it proprietary? Is it because these guys develop all the software for you as well? No, I mean, most of the software for an ISA isn't written by the companies who, shall, who sell parts for that ISA. It's done by other people. Like all the developers out there do all that software development, right? Um, and it's not because these are great ISAs, right? You know, like these are the only people who could ever come up with something as wonderful as their creations, like x86, v 7 v 8 right? It's, 
you know, is, is that why we chose those ISAs? Because they're so great. Um, they're just not the most, the, the best ISA in the world. If you wanted to do an ISA, you would not pick one of those, right? It's just what's out there, what they got, right? So they're not the wonderful ISAs either. One other piece of FUD we hear from, you know, people who are promoting the licensed ISAs, well, you know, our company will guarantee compatibility for you, make sure the hardware runs stuff. Um, ISA is one of the easiest things to verify compared to other industry standards like Wi-Fi, you know, LTE, this other stuff. This is like trivial, right? Making sure ISAs are compatible. It's an important thing. You want to have it be there. It's not anywhere near difficult enough to require billions of dollar investment in a company to do this, right? You, know, you could have small labs certifying ISA compatibility. It's much simpler than lots of other things to which the industry has open interfaces and has people verifying compatibility and things work together, okay? So there's no technical reason why I say shouldn't be free and open. It's purely historical and business reasons why these things have been locked up. Um, another big issue and one that impacts us as researchers is those proprietary ISAs are not guaranteed to last. Some of you may remember a pretty large computer company called Digital Equipment Corporation, right? And they had some pretty important ISAs at one point, VAX and Alpha. They're both gone, right? If you built all that software, you spent the billions shooting your stuff for their ISAs, and for some bad business decision at that company, the company goes under. What do you do with your software? Well, you move it to a different ISA. That's a big cost. And as researchers, I know that a lot of researchers, for example, built research infrastructure around the digital alpha ISAs, kind of relatively nice and clean. That's all gone, and what's worse is you cannot choose to keep it going because there's probably some small IP holding firm that has the stuff and will go after you because it was proprietary and it seemed to be worth something, right? So um, the I, proprietary ISA is a guarantee. I guarantee that Intel x86 will not be around indefinitely. At some point, it will be replaced, right? Same with ARM, right? Every ISA will die <laughs> eventually. Um, so they're not guaranteed to last. So that's another thing. And you can't choose to maintain them afterwards necessarily if they've been proprietary. Um, so let's say we actually had a viable freely open ISA, what would the benefits be? Well, um, we believe one of the big things would just be greater innovation from uh, many, many core designers. So you've had a standard, companies could compete on the quality of their implementation rather than the aggressiveness of their lawyers, right? They could actually compete on the quality of what they built. And um, we think that would allow many, many core designs. It would also support open source core designs. Right now, you know, you cannot, even if you do all the work yourself, put an ARM uh, V7, V8 core out there, and have other people look at it and try to improve it. That's just not allowed. You'll, be, you'll get takedown notice straight away. Okay. Um, another thing that um, some entities find uh, a little discomforting about buying proprietary ISA implementations is they don't trust the countries that those companies work in uh, to produce things that don't have trapdoors in. So if you're you know, the Chinese government, the Indian government, African government, I don't know if you'd want to trust the UK or the US companies to give you a core that didn't have trapdoors in. And this is a real issue and you know, revelations the last few years, you know, stuff goes on that you wouldn't imagine actually went on. And so these are not just the tinfoil hat brigade, these are serious people and other governments worrying about trapdoors in these designs. Um, now cost of licensing these is actually probably one of the minor issues. There is a, if you actually negotiate a deal, the cost is not burdensome, but the time to negotiate the deal and some of the upfront costs matter. And so if you're smart startups and the newest, hottest thing here at Stanford, you're all, you know, money grubbing capitalists, you know, that's the Berkeley view anyway. So you have all your startup ideas, you want to get ideas out there quickly. Um, the time to negotiate the agreement and the upfront money may stop you doing it. It'd be nice to have something you can quickly use without thinking about it to get your idea off the ground. Because usually that's not a critical component in your grand idea. You just need a core that kind of runs all the software, right? Um, and for us, the original motivation was to make architecture education and research more real. So actually have real things that you know, we could fabricate, we could run code on, we could port stacks to, and make it more real than um, sort of toy simulators that kind of only just model uh, one of these hardware things. And also if we invest all this work in our you know, infrastructure, we don't want it to disappear when the company goes under, like, like what happened with DEC. Okay. Um, so we all agree we need a free and open ISA, so which one are we going to use? Um, so what style of ISA? Well, if the ISA doesn't really matter too much in terms of end system energy performance, as implementers, you want to pick one that's easy to implement, right? There's no reason to go do something like an x86. You'd want to do something relatively simple. And, you know, Seymour Cray's load store designs, later refined into risk, those seem like a great choice. Those design ideas have survived many generations of technology and seem like an, uh, a sensible place uh, to, you know, put your stake in the ground. And so this looks like what 
you know, risk style ISA seems to be the ISA you want to build to make it open standard, right? So it should be a risk style ISA. Now, we're not the first people to think about doing a free and open risk style ISA. There's been a bunch of others. Um, so one, to give us credit, Spark V8, um, Sun Microsystems uh, actually made Spark V8 and IEEE standard, an open standard. You could go download the spec. I think it was $99 to get a license to build them, very cheap. So, and there's actually, Sun also actually put out open source cores that um, for V8 and some for V9 even. Um, that were open and available for people to use. Uh, there's a, a company in, uh, in Europe, Geisler, they offer um, some open source cores that match V8 as well. Um, so that's one example that's, that's already been done. Um, open Risk is a large effort started by a group of uh, Slovenian undergraduates in 1999 who apparently took Dave's book and uh, Dave and John's book and typed in the DLX description to Verilog, uh, or modified it slightly, and that's the Open Risk core. Um, that's gone through a couple of generations. Um, so that one's been out there for a while. There's a small community built, built around that, and many, actually several SOCs have been built using that uh, open risk core. Um, a more recent one we just heard about was the Open Processor Foundation. Um, this is uh, folks who are involved with the Hitachi SH risk architecture. And in Japan, it turns out that you know, Hitachi is no longer interested in pushing that. The patents are expiring. And so some of the designers and people are trying to push that out as an open source available uh, core for people to use. Um, another example I just... Uh, been hearing a lot about lately is this Lattice Micro 32. They have a 32-bit simple risk soft core that's available for anybody to download and use. So there are a bunch of open, we're not the first people to think of one. There's a bunch out there. Why do we do something different? Well, um, when we started the Risk 5 project, um, this was back in 2010. So my group, you know, Dave's group, lots of previous projects, we'd worked on many different ISAs, commercial ones, our own ones. Um, and sort of basically every so often you sit down and say, for the next big research infrastructure, what I say am I going to use? So back in 2010, uh, we sort of did that. What are we going to use for the next bunch of projects? Um, so the obvious choices at that time were, you know, Intel x86 or ARM. Those are the two choices. So we sat down, look at these, and so you crack open the x86 manual. What's the first opcode? AAA. So what's AAA? Yeah, ASCII adjust after addition, right? So how you turn your BCD thing in the low nibble into something that you can, you know, carry add six and carry the high bit. You know, when you look at that and you say, there's no way I'm going to implement <laughs> this ISA. Um, so the X86. Right, that's good. They put that first because you know, <laughs> here be dragons, right? You know, so so I X86 just impossible, right? So it's way too complicated for anybody to consider implementing now. Um, and there's all the IP issues, right? You really couldn't do this anyway, even if you wanted to. Um, so then we looked at ARM, the other choice. It's a risk architecture. If you look at it, you say, well, you know, to paraphrase Douglas Adams, this is kind of mostly impossible, right? So <laughs> it's, you know, very complicated also. Um, it's definitely not a lean risk design um, and massive IP issues. Yep. 64 bit is a little better, except. It's not much better because it includes a 32-bit. So it's strictly greater than the six, you know, this 32-bit. Um, so, and the 32-bit includes several ISAs, not just one. All right. So way, way complicated. If you actually wanted to, why would you want to use these? It's because you want to use a software stack. If you want to use the ARM software stack, you got to do a lot of work to bring things up. Right. So this is, you know, mostly impossible, complex, a lot of IP issues. When we started this, we didn't, we thought there were IP issues. Since then, we've learned a lot about, yes, there are very, very, very serious IP issues with ARM and other issues. Okay. So in the summer of 2010, we decided like a, you know, a three month project um, to develop our own clean slate ISA, right? So, you know, four years later, um, <laughs> we released the, uh, the frozen, now frozen user level uh, ISA specification. But it's not like we just sat down, wrote the spec for four years, and then shipped it. We, uh, over those four years, we'd actually did many silicon implementations, did drafts, got rounds of feedback from people outside of uh, Berkeley. And so it's evolved a lot and been cleaned up over time uh, with input from many, many people, not just folks at Berkeley. Um, yep. What about Mix and Netflix? Yeah, um, those I, I categorize as not being real ISAs you would use for hardware implementation. Knuth would say otherwise. We'd love to see a silicon, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I think you, yeah, I looked at those a while ago. Um, they're not really designed for um, the kind of purposes we're designed for, so. Were there protected modes uh, that were tentative uh, in these implementations, or were they? Yeah, they boot Linux, for example. 
So, so they do have a supervisor. Uh, it's just yeah, yeah, I'll talk about that later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So one thing I'll say: RISC V is not an open source processor, right? RISC V is a specification for an ISA. There happen to be people building open source processors to the RISC V ISA spec, including ourselves. But there are many other groups building those cores. For all I know, there are, well, actually, I do know of at least one company building their own core proprietary, which is fine. So the point is RISC-V is about an interface specification. That's the biggest part of the project. We happen to be also doing cores and chip generators that people can use, right? So it's an ISA spec. And I think the important thing, um, when people talk about open source hardware, I've sort of been realizing that the kind of bug in how people think about this, the real hard part about building hardware is the software. And the thing people do wrong when they attack an open source hardware project is they focus on the hardware, right? So you've got these hardware, that doesn't matter. Look, all the cost is in the software development. If you're building a chip, most of the software is completely independent of your special widget on that chip. So what you want to have is open source hardware generator that generates the hardware that, for which most of the software already exists, or almost all of the software. Like 99.99% of it is ready there. You don't have to touch it. That would dramatically lower the cost of doing new hardware startups, right? There's a standard specification for most of the software stack. You just had to worry about the little widget you added um, to that. So we're also expanding the RISC V spec out to cover, as well as the supervisor level, things like how I always handled, how other parts of the chip are handled, how accelerators are plugged in. So the point is to build this out to a full spec of what target SOC should look like. And again, actually, the implementation piece is, is great, but that's not actually the primary thing. The thing is, if you get this spec nailed down, people agree to it. Everybody can build stuff, everybody can share stuff, but you can build proprietary implementations and you can much lower the, the barrier to entry to people doing new hardware design. So the way to get better, more hardware startups, is allow them to use open source software, right? That's the, that's the trick. Okay. Um, so let's dive into what is RISC-V. Um, so when designing this, we wanted to make this an ISA that worked for everything, from very small to very large processes. Also, very important was we wanted the ISA to be a base to support custom accelerators extensions. So you want to add your, you know, build a special engine to do whatever. We wanted to let you be able to use RISC-V as a base, and in particular, to reuse a software infrastructure around RISC-V when extending it and adding new things. So there are actually three base integer ISAs, um, depending on the address width you want in the system. So there's RV32i is the 32-bit address space, RV64i is the 64-bit address space, and RV128 is the 128-bit address space version, right? In the first drafts, we kind of added that in as a kind of a joke, like, yeah, here's the 128-bit version, because it fit our instruction template, our design pattern worked for that as well. And we'd read in a, you know, some very famous people a while back said, the only mistake an ISA can't recover from is not having enough address bits. <laughs> so we want to make sure that wasn't an issue. Subsequently, in talking to people, this is perhaps closer in than most people think. Some of the um, data center clusters have solid state stores um, they're actively using in production of 10 petabytes. That's 54 bits of addressing right now. It's not directly addressed as memory right now, but people are working on much faster networks, um, different ways of looking at it. And you never want to densely pack an address space with stuff. So sometime next decade, there might be a need for 120 bit or more than 64 bit addressing. Uh, at the data center scale, when we have solid state memories that are that big. Okay, so we're ready. You know, we already have the ISA defined, um, ready to go. The nice thing about this base integer ISA for all three of those is the base is only 40 hardware instructions you need to implement. And those are selected so nobody in their right mind would choose to subset and omit them, any of those, right? And the nice thing about those 40, there is enough to run a modern software stack. So GCC, uh, dynamic linking, big code, uh, running an OS. You don't need more than that to do all those functions. So when you want to build an accelerator, we think you'd be kind of crazy to define your own ISA. You should just take this one and extend it, and you can start with a full compiler suite on, from the get-go, right? So, and that's all you need to implement, and it's very, very simple. On top of that, we split the extension world into sort of standard extensions, which we help define and make sure don't conflict with themselves and other future standard extensions and non-standard extension, standard extensions. We can do whatever you want, right? So the standard extensions are already defined at what we call MAFD. M is integer multiply divide. A is atomics for a multiprocessor support. Um, F is single precision floating point. D is double precision floating point. So this combination of IMAFD we call G, and we view that as being a very good general purpose ISA. Yep. 
warning circuits. They include all the Protected, privileged state management. No, so yeah, question, the question was, do those include the supervisor? So um, we were very clear, and this was reading lots of ISA manuals, has been thing I've been doing a lot lately. It's, it's surprising to me how much they mix up supervisor stuff and microarchitecture with the ISA specification. In RISC-V, we're very clear to separate out the user level stuff from both the supervisor level stuff and the microarchitecture. Makes the ISA description much simpler and avoids polluting people's heads with weird ideas about what matters in the ISA. So the ISA is very much agnostic to supervisor or privilege mode. I'll talk a little bit about privilege mode in a minute. Yep. Is the instruction set virtualizable? Yes. That was one of the design goals. Um, it's designed to be classically virtualizable. So you can run a guest OS at user level, and all the traps will happen as you expect. So yeah, that was a design goal. I'll talk about that in a minute. So. So this G is what we think of as a pretty good general purpose instruction set, and that's now frozen. And the idea is we're going to preserve this forever. So you know, in the future, now if you want to, one, one goal here is not to keep adding instructions to this. One bug I see in ISA designs is people keep adding instructions. So that means a future implementer has to add all these extra instructions, even if they didn't really need them. Most instructions that get added only help a certain class of programs. They may help them a lot, but they only help a certain class of programs. Beyond this base set, it's very hard to add an instruction that helps almost any, every application. Yep. Don't you think there will still be instructions, they won't help all programmers, but will help enough in certain cases that they're required, that you really want them? Like, for example, the various fence instructions that have been added to the Intel architecture, those are really important for doing the base. Uh What about, I'm not as familiar with these, but there are new instructions in the next generation of Intel chips that will use cache coherence to do locking even more efficiently than we could today. It just seems like people are continually discovering new things that could have a major impact. You, you think that, no, history is done, the age of progress is over? There are, um, it's very um, educational to look at ARM V8 and see what they threw out over the year and look at where, the, where everybody, and if you look at MIPS R6, that just released my imagination, you go look at what's happening. Everybody's converged back to pretty simple set of instructions. Fences and atomics are very important, and actually the base ISA, one of those 40 instructions is a fence. Um, but the atomics are pulled out separately because one of the applications is deep embedded where you only have one core and it talks to everything else through FIFOs. You don't actually need the atomics. So the transactional memory is one that we didn't put in this G because I view that as not baked yet. So people haven't quite figured out what that should be. It's an extension. So our goal is we mandate, you know, we have these base that, that work and they're fixed. You have extensions to add things on and we want to support a large number of extensions later. But we want also to not um, get away from this course. So when you don't need that other stuff, you don't have to implement it. The tools will be there to support you in doing that. I think the important, yeah, important thing to separate out is people building future general purpose platforms from people developing embedded specialized systems. These are two communities with quite different needs, but there's no reason for them to have substantially different ISAs. Yeah, so I think this is uh, an important thing that Chris has done is he's made a modular instruction set that with SOCs you can pick the pieces you want and there's room for growth in the future, but that has, this part has to be there. So this is a different instruction set. Other instruction sets aren't designed to be subsetable. They're gigantic and growing. Right. Yeah, so, so if you want to implement ARM V8, for example, even if you ignore the 32-bit the stuff, it's big and bloated. I mean, it's, it's monstrous. 5,000 page manual. Right. Yes. 5,000 page And page. you know what I bet, you know, if you did the study, it would probably help performance a little bit. And you would probably have better spent your designer's time on everything else, like the microarchitecture and all that kind of stuff, rather than verifying all those instructions. So, you know, I really don't think, there's a, you know, that wasn't the wise decision on their part, but that's okay. It's their project. So, anyway, so in our project, um, just to go over the, the base, so there are some interesting differences. It, we try to be very vanilla risk because it works. Right? There's no real, you know, people seem to come back full circle to this again and again and again. So the base ISA encoding, the base is 32-bit fixed width naturally aligned instructions, 32 integer registers plus X zeros, including X00 register. Um, RSR1, uh, RS1, RS2, and the destination register in fixed positions. They don't move around. Makes the encode, decoding simple. Um, we only have a 12-bit immediate in the base format. That was a very uh, conscious design decision. 16-bit immediates are too big. They ruin the possibility of doing lots of extensions simply. Um, we support IEEE 2008 floating point. So there's also a four-register format not shown here to support that. 
And this very simple base ISA supports, like I said, PIC dynamic linking, a lot of things you need for a modern uh, ISA software stack. Okay. Um, uh, just one thing, the atomic operations. Uh, this is one of the standard extensions. This has two categories of atomics. One is uh, AMOs, so fetch and op, add, um, or max min kind of things on a single word in memory. There's also the load reserve store conditional style. Uh, and with that, we've added a uh, forward progress guarantee for short sequences of a certain size. Now, um, one new thing here is all the atomics are annotated with two bits, uh, acquire and release to support um, a release consistency models, which is what's in the modern language um, standards. So that's actually built into the ISA support for this. If you set both bits, it becomes strongly, uh, strongly ordered. Um, uh, now, transactional memory is an interesting thing that we are interested in, but I don't think the design is solid enough to standardize it. We've argued about it at length over years um, and not come up with something we're happy with. I think the industry still hasn't quite figured that out yet, but I think that will happen. We have an extension reserved for that. Yep. So, so as I understand that, you've essentially not made a commitment to your memory model. You are embracing all, all useful memory. No, it's a, it's, it's a relaxed memory model, and this, this is how you, uh, there's a fence instruction in the base, plus the MOs can have acquire at least orderings added to them. So the memory model is fixed, it's known. Um, is defined, that we've, we've committed that. Okay. Um, so now, one the thing that's different from normal risks, it has supports variable length encoding. And this was a design in from the start. But the idea here was the base instruction set, you don't have to worry about this. They can all be 32-bit fixed width, naturally aligned. But we wanted to support both compressed instructions and variable length extended instructions to support really big extensions. And so, in the ISA, basically the low two bits, so the 32-bit standard ones, are always 1-1. One, one. If they're 0-1, 1-0, zero, one, zero, or 0-0, zero, zero, it's a 16-bit instruction. There's also encodings reserved for longer 4864-bit and basically arbitrarily long uh, instruction encodings. It's designed that those are in the first parcel, 16-bit parcel you see, so it's easy for the instruction fetch unit to figure out the lengths, right? That's a design thing. Um, and the only impact this really has is the base I say, the branches and jumps target 16-bit um, uh, granularity addresses. So all the branch and jump targets are 16-bit aligned. That means you lose one bit of range in the base I say, but in exchange for that, you get to support these other things which you think are very valuable. Um, in particular, we've defined, we've, in the process of defining this compressed instruction extension, and what's really nice about this compared to, say, the arms or other people's things is you just mix these in with the base I say instructions. So when you add this extension in, the base 32-bit instructions now can be only 16-bit aligned, and you can mix in the 16-bit instructions, and nothing's changed in that base encoding. For those of you who don't know, for example, ARM Thumb 2 allows you to mix 16-bit and 32-bit, but those 32-bit instructions are different from the 32-bit only instructions. And those 16-bit instructions are different from Thumb 1, which had 16-bit only instructions. And all three of those ISAs are supported by ARM V7 cores. And ARM V8 cores, in addition, support the 64-bit instructions, right? Anyway, so basically the model here is each instruction, 16-bit instruction, expands to a single regular instruction. And using this technique, we get around a 25% reduction in code size. And the code size is actually pretty good. It's smaller with this extension. It's quite a bit smaller than x86. It's slightly bigger than thumb two, a few percent, three percent kind of range. Uh, the reason is that we don't implement load multiple, store multiple, which are the, if we had those, we'd be comparable to thumb two. We decided those cause some microarchitectural pain, so we didn't actually add those into the C extension, at least in the current draft. Question? Um, the C compressed instruction set extension that you say is defined here is chapter 13, which is three sentences long. So it's There's a much fuller this, draft that will come out soon. There's, there's actually a master's paper. thesis that has a prototype of it. Which I've read. Right. And, and I had concerns that a lot of the compression gains would happen as you venture down to 8-bit instructions. And so I... I, I, at the end of it, I, I I thought it might need another pass before. Well, we're putting out a draft for comment um, okay. pretty soon. Um, we're working on the privileged stuff first. That's kind of the priority to get that out. Um, but the compressed one will come out shortly. And the, the hope is to get the community involved in defining this. Now, one thing is we're going to say no to lots of suggestions we already have. But we would love to get the input to make sure we're not missing something. Right. Um, so. Let's move on to the privileged architecture. That was the user-level architecture. So I view this as a place where there's place, uh, uh, a lot of space for innovation, let's say. So I think reading through lots of ISA manuals, this has been incredibly messy in most platform specifications. And this is reflected in the complexity of, say, you know, the current operating system ports. 
So what we're trying to do in this is provide a clean separation between the layers of the software stack. And so there's some terminology we have here that we sort of invented, but let me walk you through this. So when you're on an application, it's coded to an ABI, an application binary interface. So what is that? That's a combination of the instructions you can use plus calls out to the OS, right? That's kind of how the application does I.O., right? Um, and the application doesn't care how those ABI calls are implemented. There's some what we call application execution environment, AEE, implements the ABI. That AEE could be a hardware platform. It could be software emulation. It could be, you know, some virtualized thing somewhere else or just a software simulator, right? The application will still work correctly, provided you implement the ABI correctly. For the OS, our plan is, at supervisor level, we're not going to let the OS touch the hardware. It has a supervisor binary interface that defines, in addition to the user level instructions, what extra privilege instructions can it use, what those mean, and a supervisor binary interface that says how it talks to the outer environment, which is some supervisor execution environment. Okay, now, recursing down, People like to play with hypervisors, so a hypervisor, what is that? There's something that provides a supervisor binary interface to an OS, and we're not going to let that touch the hardware either. So there's a hypervisor binary interface down to a hypervisor execution environment. Now, so for example, look at the OS. Our goal is not to have to do a power virtualized OS, because no OS will ever deal with real devices. Those will be handled out of the platform. We want to provide a very fast I.O., virtual I.O. style interface to OSs. They'll have to discover the devices, but they won't be banging bits in device registers, right? That shouldn't have to happen. And I think if you look at the future of SLCs, this is, there's going to be processes out there. This can be handled in very different ways. I think we need to get away from um, having the OS bit banging on device registers. They shouldn't do that. And the advantage of doing this, and our goal is a single OS image will run on any RISC-V platform. Just one image. You won't have to configure and set it up. Just one image will run everywhere. Same with the hypervisor. We do that later. Where does this stop? Maybe you're about to answer that. Does, you know, if yeah. there more, why shouldn't there be more layers under the hypervisor? And it, stops, it stops where you want it to stop. So, you, I mean, as long as the layers above, if you want to use an OS, you have to provide a supervisor execution environment. You can choose how you want to do that. Um, but the hardware, in cases where you're actually running this on native hardware, as opposed to an emulation or simulation, um, it's going to stop at the hardware level, and we're going to hide the hardware between a, 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 uh, behind a hardware abstraction layer. And this is similar to those of you know Alpha, the PAL code. A few differences between PAL code is that our HAL code is mostly invisible to those layers. So things like emulating missing instructions, the HAL code will take care of. There's no direct calls into it. You should be going through some, you know, question mark BI, some binary interface to get the stuff you want to do. So this really just hides most of the hardware from these layers. So for example, reset, where does reset happen? It goes into the HAL. Everything else, there's some defined entry point to that binary where you get called once the system is set up. So this is, again, part of hiding the platform details from it. And we build, and this is for our research group, we build test chips, we build FPGA emulations, we build simulations. We have this wide diversity of platforms. And this is mostly for us, but I think it's what you need for all platforms. Yeah. Maybe not quite getting something. So where do device drivers fit in? Are these down now? Device drivers are effectively not part of the operating system. They're more part of the C or the HAL at this level then? They, they could be, but so the, thing to, the most important thing is the OS just has an interface to them. You can package them how you see fit. We're actually looking at how to um, do IOMU style, uh, define that so that HAL can reflect up IO cores to the OS that it kind of manages and knows about to do page faults on. So the device drive itself could live almost anywhere in a little bubble that some layer outside the OS will, will install it. So I don't have time to go into it. We're still working on this design. But we want to, now what, one other thing you might say is all these layers, this is going to be very inefficient. But um, part of the design is, although you talk about the hardware extraction, you might think of that as being far out in the Netherlands of the chip design. This will be in the core. And basically, it's all about when you take a trap, where do you go? what base address and what privilege mode and how is translation happening at that point in time. So the hardware is going to vector you to the right place at the right time to avoid, you're not going to be jumping up and down through these layers, hopefully. Is the hardware abstraction layer in a position to prevent the, its guest from bypassing it? Yes. Okay. It can be. In a platform you implement, it can be. So, yeah. Are interrupts part of the SBI? So the only interrupts the OS has are two. It has a timer interrupt and a software interrupt. Devices communicate through the software interrupt, which acts as a mailbox. Those are the only two interrupts the SP in the SBI the OS sees. Oh, actually, sorry, here first. Oh, 
Um, when you're running on a Z board, which I notice you do, um, do you use the same abstraction layer when... We, we haven't implemented this yet. We okay. are working towards it. Okay, but, but, but I presume the relationship between the ARM cores on the Z board will take on the same form? Well, as so, so in our, when we're emulating things, um, like for example, this SBI, all this part below will be done by the, some combination of the ARM cores, the FPGA, and the tethered thing that's driving the zinc board. Um, this OS won't have to care, like where it is. That's, that's the goal. This is, a, this is a work in progress. This is not complete. This is our design goal to bring this out. And the I.O. we want to... It's the intent. It's the intent. Yeah, we're working towards this. So, okay. Um, so currently, the sort of privilege spec, we're defining these four supervisor environments. And the goal here is really to support current popular OSs. It's not right now to do supervisor OS level research. We just want to run standard supervisor OSs and support them. So um, in particular, there's a bare metal mode, there's no translation, there's base and bounds mode. Then there's these two demand page 32-bit modes, 32-bit virtual address space, 43-bit virtual address space, or 64-bit systems. These are very conventional page systems. Yep. Sorry, is virtual memory an architectural thing, or is that yes. down in the SPI, no, no, CE? No, the, the OS manages page tables. It doesn't see TLBs, and it doesn't do TLB flushes. It has instead a fence on memory management state. So there's a memory model around touching the page tables, what that means. So a fence.mm means that from the next instruction, we'll see the effect you just, any writes you've done to the, the page table structure. So the page table structure is defined. It can be done software hardware, but OS won't get to do the software refill. It's, um, it does see the page table format, yes. And it sees supervisor physical memory that it maps to, supervise, uh, to user virtual. Question? So the supervisor doesn't, and we designed the supervisor interface so it doesn't know anything about being virtualized. This is one of the virtualization goals. Below that, we can add a hypervisor that has its own interface to things like Shadow. We're not working on that. That's not something we're going to do anytime soon. If people want to look at that. That'd be great. Um, we just want to make it clean so the supervisor uh, binary interface only sees things the supervisor needs to worry about. And as I said, because we designed the device interface this way, there's no sense of power virtualized because it's, it's always the same. There's no this versus that. You're kind of always running power virtualized, which means power virtualized means nothing. You're always just virtualized in some sense, right? Um, okay, so the, again, these are just designed to support the current popular OSs. These are not, you know, new things, the page table formats, they're very vanilla. And that was deliberate just to bring the current OSs up as, as guest OSs in here. Um, so there's a big ecosystem being built up. So risk5.org is the official website that we've set up to distribute stuff. Don't go looking at other random Berkeley websites. We use this in our classes. The versions they have over there are hacked, modified, early drafts. Don't rely on those to build anything. Mm -hmm. So as people have done and complain. Um, so risk5.org is the official outlet. Um, so the privileged ISA should come out very soon. Um, software tools, the whole GNU tool chain, LVM, Linux, some verification suite, stuff to run in the Zinc. Um, software implementations, including one in JavaScript, uh, a reference, go to model, Spike in C++, and a QMU port are all up there. Uh, we have this hardware implementation out, Rocket Core, Soda. There's actually a whole bunch of people around the world building RISC V implementations. Um, and so just to show this, this angel thing, you, know, you can boot Linux in a browser. So it implements the RISC V uh, ISA and the old sort of supervisor state in JavaScript. So anybody can run it in a browser. It runs about two MIPS. We went to the workshop last weekend. There's somebody who gets this kind of thing running at 20 MIPS. We'll probably steal all this his good ideas and have a 20 MIPS thing that runs in your browser. Why would you want this? For teaching, right? You have a, without installing anything, you can run this stuff in a browser and, and just run, get things going. Um, QMU is much, much faster. So this runs about 700 dry stone MIPS on a modern x86. This is a, you know, QMU's ginning technology. And this is the development environment of choice if you want to develop OSs on it. This is, you know, the QMU implementation is by far the most usable, fastest RISC V implementation out there. This is what you should be pointing code to. Um, so we're writing all this, all the core, so RISC V is a spec. We actually are doing an open source core, we call Rocket. And one difference there is we're writing this is in this new hardware description language called Chisel, uh, which is, uh, the chisel, the name stands for constructing hardware in a Scala embedded language. So here at Stanford, most of you know Scala. It's very popular out here. Um, but it's a very powerful modern language compiles to the JVM. 
Um, the nice thing is it's functional plus option toided. It's designed to support embedded DSLs. We embedded a hardware DSL into Scala, and you write a single chisel program, and from that you can generate a very fast cycle accurate, bit accurate software simulator in C++ or FPGA Verilog that you can use for emulation or ASIC Verilog you can use to push through and actually do chip designs. Um, We've released this as BSD open source at chisel.exe.berkeley.edu. We're working on our grand plans for Chisel 3.0. Um, having worked with Chisel for a while, we realized that what we really want to do is build what we call the LLVM for hardware. We have this standard intermediate representation we call FIRTL, uh, F-I-R-R-T-L, which is a flexible intermediate representation for RTL. So FIRTL is going to be um, this internal format. You can write many passes for this and basically do transformations. And this will then make Chisel just be a front end into which you come into Fertile, and you can come in from other hardware description languages is the plan, and use the tool, the tool chain there. Yep. Um, I ran into some grumblings about the literal declarations in Scala not being pretty, which is to say they're, they weren't able to get the literals in Chisel to be the way you wish. Is that going to get fixed? In other words, is Scala getting revised to address the I think Scala is adding stuff all the time, and we're tracking that, but there's a tension between making it better and breaking all the code we have. Okay. Um, and it, it, it's really, it's really improving. Our Scala gets better at supporting DSLs. Okay. Things like that might change. But we worry. So actually going to 3.0, there's one incompatibility with current Scala in the front end that we're going to have to deal with. This is language design. But it's very powerful. Uh, really helps us build lots of cores. We use this in the classroom. So use RISC-5 in teaching. There's a set of cores you can go download called Sodor. Um, we use train names for all of our processor cores at Berkeley, and Sodor is the island that Thomas the Tank Engine and all his trains live on, so these are the educational cores to go download. <laughs> and one of the nice ones is actually a little microcode engine. We used to teach people microcode. And in Scala itself, we write a microcode compiler so students can write new microcode, have it compile and run, and they can see it step through so they can learn how microcode machines work. Um, we use this to build chips. So we built many RISC-V silicon artifacts. Um, in uh, two lines of uh, chips. One, is, one project is about silicon photonics, actually, but we're using it to fabricate uh, RISC-V cores. We've done five, five tape outs so far. The last one is EOS 20. Um, it's a dual core uh, cache coherent design built from our chip generator, uh, runs Linux. Um, boots and Linux is a photograph of the die. Here's the two RISC-V cores down here. Uh, this is one megabyte of SRAM. This is a bunch of experimental photonic links. This is kind of a block diagram that's on there. So there's a scalar core, a vector core. Uh, first level caches that are kept coherent with a hub out here. So, you know, and this is the, the fourth tape out, and we keep doing these, like every few months we have tape outs of different RISC V cores. We've managed to iteratively refine the RTL as well as the, you know, playing with the ISA earlier on. Um, another really cool one is Raven 3. This is in 28 nanometer FDOSI, FDSOI. Um, and this is a cool project that uses a, instead of, um, they use an on chip DC DC converter to power the chip. But instead of regulating the output power, which is what you would normally want to do in a processor, we instead modulate the clock frequency to track the instantaneous voltage. So we let the power supply ripple, and the DC-DC will switch here and then boost the voltage again. But as you can see, the clock gets slower as VDD decreases. We're doing very, very fine grain DVFS, if you like, within uh, a DC-DC switching event to raise efficiency. Um, this is a plot of it. Here's the, the core here, RISC-5 core with a vector unit. DC-DCs are over here. Uh, and this thing, uh, these are actually scope traces, actually runs Boots Linux while all this is happening. And we're getting over 30 gigaflops of watt on uh, double precision matrix multiply. We're actually running the code. This is double precision IEEE, you know, fuse MOLAD um, floating point unit, right? So this is the rocket generator, a uh, different, slightly different system. How much did you gain in efficiency by, by pulling this? It's about, it's actually difficult to measure. You have to figure out how to measure it because you have to include the, normally people measure DC DCs by power in, power out. But we want to measure it by work done by the processor versus power in. So you have to factor in how accurate is the clock tracking um, the, the work, uh, the process and the output. But about 15, 20%. But the biggest gain is actually you can have many of these on a chip. Many DC, DC levels, many voltage levels, instead of having fewer off-chip supplies. Right? That's actually the biggest gain. That thing actually runs down to 0.45 volts, um, that design. Um, so Rocket we released last week. It's a classic single issue in order, but a dual issue is coming very soon. It's very similar to like an ARM A5 right now. We'll support something similar to an ARM A7. You know, it has a BTP BHD return address stack. It's a pretty sophisticated, simple core. It's sort of app designed to be an application processor, not a really stripped down embedded core, um, because that's what we wanted for our designs. And it has a co-processor interface to make it easy to add accelerators on the side. Um, 
Okay, um, so people keep asking how we compare to ARM. Um, we did this little comparison just because we could and uh, you know, let people move on. Um, so ARM publishes these numbers for an A5 core that's with a certain configuration, no floating point unit, uh, no neon. Um, we happen to have access to the same technology, so we mapped our rocket core. And basically we're, you know, we're smaller, um, faster, uh, much lower power, and we're 64 bit instead of 32 bit, right? Now some of this is some stuff in the ARM core we don't have, but there's some stuff in our core they don't have. It's not a completely accurate comparison, but just to give you a feel, we're pretty competitive. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's what it is. Uh, so we're not just doing in-order cores. There's a student working on out-of-order cores we call Boom, Berkeley out-of-order machine. Um, this is a parameterized out-of-order machine. You can change issue width, uh, function needs you have attached. Um, you know, this has been laid out. It's running at a couple of gigahertz. Uh, um, and you know, at some point this will be open source once we get more of the bugs out. It kind of runs most of spec in right now, but there's still some bugs when we're working through it. It's actually hard to design an out-of-order core that performs better than an in-order core. <laughs> That's what we found. You have to get a lot of things right to have it really fly. How long does it take to run the chisel job to compile this? Um, it's got a lot better just recently. <laughs> it did take a long time. There was a very dumb pass in the chisel compiler. It turned out using a very bad algorithm, talking about algorithms. Um, it's since, I think it's uh, minutes or so. But remember this, that just generates the Verilog. Getting to this stage, you have to run through all the VLSI flow. Um, so that takes hours to get through, to get the layout. Um, so external users. Um, there's uh, folks in the UK who are building SOCs. They're going to, in volume production, they have a private sponsor. And these are some of the folks who did the Raspberry Pi before. Some of those founders of the Raspberry Pi are doing this. And the goal is education and to get people hacking hardware again. Um, and the private sponsor, wants, that's his goal, why he's funding this project. Um, they're basing that on the RISC V cores. Um, BlueSpec in the US, CAD company, they're actually selling people or giving people RISC V cores. Their customers wanted a simple core to include. So they just use RISC V, all the tool chain is there. The government of India, for some reason, has decided that RISC V is the national ISA for India. <laughs> so they, they had their own project. For political reasons. Well, well on rapid IO. No, was... so there's, there's two reasons you have to realize. One is the Indian government is looking at um, their GDP and their imports. And what they're seeing is as a fraction of their imports, semiconductors are rising to become unsustainable. They need their own semiconductor industry. That's one thing. The other thing is they are worried about security in uh, the defense systems. So they want to use, have their own core they control to do this. Um, and so more and more people are starting to, we're starting to hear about people using this. Um, so to help build a community, uh, a couple of things will be happening. One is a, we'll be setting up a nonprofit foundation to uh, promote, manage uh, the ISA, uh, help people implement it, um, support the people implementing it. Um, we're going to have the first RISC V workshop, January 14th, 15th. This is going to be in uh, Monterey, uh, the Marriott there. Um, it's uh, free to all academics, faculty, students, anywhere, um, all the affiliates of our Aspire Lab. Um, and it's open to anybody for $99, which basically almost covers the food bill. Uh, so we'll feed you well. Um, you can register online at this address. If you just go to RISC5.org, it's all, you can get to it there. It's filling up fast, surprisingly fast, and it's first come, first serve, you know. Um, so sign up soon, um, and it's about all I have uh, here. Just want to end with this is one part of the Aspire Lab, and this is what we call our lasagna stack. So this is all the projects going on in Aspire, and this is about 11 faculty and about 50 to 60 grad students. Um, so RISC V kind of evolved from this, and actually it's the core of a lot of the work people do. At Berkeley, we actually all work together uh, on these big projects and actually work together. Um, and RISC V is the core of the infrastructure. All this stuff is uh, based around. Okay, uh, I just want to thank all the people who actually paid for all this. Um, and I should have slide all the many students, but uh, that'd be quite long. There's actually about, I'd say three or four core students plus another five or six who contribute quite regularly to it. Uh, you'd be building all this. Plus now uh, expanding set of people outside are actually, we're starting to get contributions back from the community. Okay, so thanks. I have a comment, okay. Oh. Suppose 10 years from now, this has completely taken over the world and has replaced the Intel instruction set and the, the ARM instruction set. Can you visualize today what sequence of events would happen that would lead to that? Or, or are there are a lot of missing steps. There's one of the steps today, and then a miracle happens. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think that um, the possible beachheads for this ISA are 
the very small and the very big, basically where the incumbents aren't incumbents. So servers is x86, will be for a while, just like 360s is mainframes. Um, you know, it's mobiles, tablets is ARM, and will be for a while, despite what Intel would like. Right? Neither of these guys are going to really make, in my opinion, neither of them are going to make substantial beachheads into the guy's story. So I think the beachheads are at the very low end of things, the IoT. Oh, there's a lot of companies out there who have great ideas for IoT, and the hardware is only a small part of the story. So the services and everything else, they would like chips that are customized and cheap. Um, they cannot deal with ARM. It's impossible to do anything with Intel. Um, so they're kind of stuck. And we hear from these people increasingly that we need something, and we want the whole software stack. Right? And that, that's, that's a story. The other extreme is the very big, the data center guys. You know, they're going to need 128 bits sometime. Every address space change, ISAs change. That seems to be a rule of the industry, right? So um, I think the very big guys have special needs. They also want to control their destiny. Um, one of the reasons this ARM is popular in the service space isn't because of the power efficiency implementations. That's just, that's just the red herring. The important thing is customers can take that and add their own stuff. They cannot do that with off-the-shelf x86 stuff. You might see Intel pushing the FPGA plus x86. That's kind of their way of getting around that for their customers. But really, the big guys, I think, want to do their own custom SOCs, these data centers, to do special source, you know, whatever. And they can't do that with the Intel thing. That's why they're using ARM. They would be much happier not to deal with ARM. ARM makes it very difficult to, um, there's only 15 companies with an architectural license that are allowed to implement an ARM core. And it has to be compatible with ARM. They cannot extend it, and they cannot design something and then sell it to a third party. The other options you license the ARM cores ARM has, and that's it. And those are not very good for, like, if you want to base and accelerate off them, you can't do that. And so what people do is they hand roll their own ISA and accelerator, and then they get killed by the software cost. That's why all these hardware startups die, because they do their own ISA because they think they have to, because everybody else is proprietary. They get killed by the software support cost. That's a really dumb thing to do. They should base it off a standard ISA that's open, add their secret source. That can be proprietary. We don't care. Um, but they would not have to rebuild, you know, GCC and bin utils and all this junk uh, every time around. Um, yep, so I think that's the beachhead. There's lots of people just doing it this, this way. And eventually, who knows, the you know, future will be something other than phones and tablets. Hmm. The NVIDIA Denver core, um, originally it was, tar it was gonna run the x86 instruction set and they had a falling out and now it's emulating ARM. Have they looked at tuning the Denver Core to run your ISA? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, it'd be nice if they did. I think one other project is people often ask, why did you define a native ISA and not a virtual machine? To get at this question a little bit. Um, I think the answer is it can't be turtles all the way down. You actually need an ISA you implement in hardware. And the reason it's going back is the cost of implementing that translation layer from one level to another is very high. The, Security issues with doing that, how trustworthy is that optimizing compilers, doing all that stuff, that's non-trivial. Your trusted code base just balloons when you do that. Um, so actually what I'm interested in is looking at things like the JVM, replacing the JVM. And you know what, if this runs everywhere, you don't actually need a virtual machine. You just need a different, slightly different ABI. And RISC-V would be, would be the VM that would run everywhere with a few bindings that will help, help support man, manage languages and other features you want to have in a VM. But then the hardware implementation would be very simple. You know, most instructions run natively. Um, on most implementations, you just have to have a you know, RISC-V to x86 converter so you can run on legacy hardware. You know, be the hope. Yep. Uh, your um, uh, low-risk friends in Cambridge have been talking to our colleagues at the okay. University of Cambridge, uh, Watson and, and company, right. Right. Uh, about the uh, possibility of, of your uh, or their integrating some of our uh, Cherry uh, yep. capability architecture into uh, right. into Risk Five. Right. I was wondering whether you're familiar with any of that. Yeah. So I I was just in Cambridge last week talking to those folks. Yeah, so um, very familiar. I'm on their advisory board, so I know yes. what they're doing. Um, so they, um, I think, what will happen is, uh, as the privilege spec, they already have a copy of the very unsuitable for mass release privilege spec, and looking at it. Um, their Cherry stuff will be added as sort of extensions onto one of the virtual memory uh, supports. And the Loris folks, the, the most likely thing is they will make that, you can enable or disable the capability stuff. So you can run the SOC just as a standard Linux box or run this stuff on top. So yeah. That's great. So this was meant, to, you know, there's meant to be a standard that you can rely, if you just, so there's different communities. Some people just want a core, they can take, use all the software works. Another community wants to take all this stuff and change it, right? And that's great. We did that. We're, we're, we're researchers. We want to encourage that, right? Doing, trying all these different things out. And so, yeah, so the user ISA supports extensions. The privileged ISA also supports extensions. We want to provide that. Yep. 
Uh, you touched on the hardware interface and device discovery. Do you have any commitments in that direction on how you interface with existing hardware, PCI devices, or and how do you have any ideas on the impacts on firmware like ACPI? And right. So. Um, I think our goal, as it has been the rest of the RISC V, is to try and do the right thing and figure out how that interfaces with the old stuff. One thing to realize is, as people move to SOCs, a lot of that stuff is, you know, PCI is going to be important, right? It's a pretty important stat. Ethernet's going to be important. But um, a lot of the other stuff, you can change it on the SOC, and you're going to want to change it for security reasons and performance. Like when you're talking 100 gigabit and up Ethernet, you kind of need to do things pretty differently. Um, another thing is we have been talking to the Linux, um, the mainline developers, and one thing I should say is most of the relevant tools are going to be mainstream sometime soon. We've been talking to all the people in all these different branches of software tools. So the Linux guys in particular, the guys supporting the non-X86 ARM SOC world, they really, really would like us to make it cleaner. So one thing you can view RISC V as a test bed for trying out, you know, how to move everything else forward, because we can be more experimental. Um, and I think we want to uh, work with the Linux guys to figure out how to make the I.O. extremely clean and work with all these standard interfaces in particular. The yeah. yeah, so we've been talking to people about you know, things like UEFI, OpenBoot, and all that, that space of things. That's down to the HAL, so it shouldn't affect most of the stack. Um, and that's one of the goals is to isolate it from um, these other things. But yeah, we're thinking about what would be our preferred thing. So I think what we'll be defining is how you would, if you want to build this kind of hardware platform, this is how you build it, this is how it should boot, things like that. So. IT Madras is playing with Rapid IO, I guess, because it's open and maybe not constrained by, uh, by PCI license uh, issues. PCI Express is obviously Intel's IP. Well, I think Rapid IO builds on, uh, well, this, okay, the protocol doesn't, but the, a lot of the implementations do. So, yeah. Um, Rapid.io, we looked at that as for the Firebox project. Um, it's uh, not as powerful as, as we'd like. It's better than PCI for connecting things. It's definitely better than PCI switches. It's not as powerful as what we'd like to do for uh, Firebox. But I view that that's an I.O. You know, issue. So I think we need to first figure out for these different classes of I.O., how we want to support it in these abstraction layers. Then we can go start talking about, that's more stretching out into hardware standards rather than interface then. They are working with ARM. There's a, there's a working group on using Rapid.io for very large systems, and the, Madr the Madras guys and ARM and various other people involved in this working group on extending Rapid.io to very large, very large systems. Like that. Um, have you talked to the cloud computing companies, and if so, what are they thinking? Uh, they're, very, they're very supportive. <laughs> yes, I would guess they would. Yeah. <laughs> they would like to help with the foundation, for example. Why are they supporting it? To do what? Why are they supporting it? I don't know. Maybe they would like a free like ISS. Openness. <laughs> openness. Openness. I like yeah. I mean, so for example, the, open, the, the Facebook guys, the Open Compute Foundation, you know, they're, they're very interested in this. You know, they would like to. Um, I think, remember, I, this is not uh, about open source necessarily. It's a specification that you can have proprietary implementations for, and you can decouple the industry. This is a very powerful thing. Our industry always, you know, thrives on standards. So. You allow more players in, you get innovation. Um, I think it's vital. I mean, I think in, I say the propriety ones are holding us back, I think, actually. You have my thoughts on costs and benefits of a formal standardization process, and are there any concerns about part of the Well, separate out in two parts. A formal spec is a very good thing. I mean, we've been talking to people at Cambridge about doing a formal spec, including the memory model. That's a great thing. Something like IEEE, I think it's a great thing for somebody else to go do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry. So I have a couple of questions actually. So you mentioned about like, the complexity and the issues around ARM. Yeah. You know, could you comment more on that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I think the, 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 what we hear back, so we're surprised at, we present this stuff with naive academics, you know. We hear that maybe ARM's an issue for some people. You know, lots of whisperings in the ear about what actually goes on. And I think one of the surprises to us, it can take up to two years to negotiate the royalty rate. So in this industry, two years is like eternity, right? Um, also, um, the upfront cost. And also, they just won't give licenses to everybody. Just because you have the money, they won't necessarily give you a license. Because there's a strategic component of who get, like, especially architectural licenses. Even if, you, even if you have the money, they won't give you a license. And even if you have the money and they give you the license, you cannot extend it. I say in a way you want to make it visible to anybody else. You have to pass the compatibility stuff. So there's these constraints that people are unhappy with. That said, it's a big ecosystem. There's lots of people very happy with it. Like my first few slides, 
If it fits your model and you can negotiate with them, you'd be crazy not to use it. It's a very well engineered, tightly coupled system. Lots of people like it. But I would say if you're really innovating and want to differentiate yourself, it's very hard in the ARM ecosystem to do that. Second, second question I have is, uh, is about security, you know, about SGX, for example, or yeah. things like that. So what's your strategy in that regard? Because it seems like it's one of the advantages that Kalima has said it can, can have if you, if you take into account the security and then the right. and all this. So I think, I think we, we've actually, in the privilege, that is a, we've observed a level for what we call trusted mode, and we haven't really expanded on that much beyond preserving a piece of the encoding space. Um, I think like transactional memory is something that's still very much research. I think one of the hopes is our ISA is simple enough that it will help designing the virtualization uh, levels and the, just keeping it simple will help with some of the security, that one factor in security. I don't, uh, I think there's a lot of challenges in security design. I don't know if all the current solutions are great, you know, like the end goal. So, but I'm hoping we can experiment with those in this framework. And some people are, like the Cambridge guys, are, they're adding capabilities, for example. Um, as their particular take on a particular security attack. Yep. Do you have any thoughts on how you manage uh, incompatible uh, yeah. uses of the instruction set, incompatible extensions? Right, there's a chapter in the ISA manual that talks about managing extensibility. So general policy is, you know, we're going to have these things that are blessed the standard extensions. There's these few we've said so far. And they're guaranteed not to conflict in the encoding space. You know, they're designed, they're laid out that way. And future standard ones will also not conflict in the encoding space. Um, we call something that uh, something else a non-standard extension. You're happy to define that however you wish. And the only thing we require is that if you implement any of the standard ones, they have to be in the standard place in the encoding space. So that means all the tools will just work. And they won't even know about the other junk you've added into the ISA. Now, if you want to standardize it, one thing we said is you package all your ISA extensions into um, uh, a portion of the encoding space, so we can easily change the prefix. You may have a research prefix that you, where you're experimenting with the ISA extensions, you do all that. But you should only have to change this prefix to remap it to a different part of the encoding space and to pack it, you know, it's like you'll get allocated at some point if it becomes part and other people agree, a standard prefix that'll make sure it doesn't collide. And what we hope to do is provide tools that make it easy for a custom embedded implementation. You can just cherry pick all the pieces you want and package them together and maybe reduce the instruction length. Um, so the ones you want are all the ones you need, and they, you can package those and have the tools generate that. So for the embedded space, that would be. So I think, again, to realize there's different customers. There's the embedded guys who want, you know, the software will never be extended by anybody else versus the general purpose development, uh, software development. Yeah. Can you define a mechanism as part of the architecture so uh, people can test for the existence of extensions? So it's really easy to tell if, if your machine has particular extensions? It's the ABI and SBI. It's not hardwired in. That shouldn't be part of the machine registers. Now, all the way down, some layer may look at registers to figure it out, but it's from the guest OS's perspective, it interrogates the SPI to figure out what's there. Because you want to lie about it sometimes. Yep. Any JVM for platform? Yeah, JVM is being ported with help from Oracle. So, um, but like I said, I view the JVM as yet another proprietary ISA. <laughs> so um, I'm actually interested in seeing how we can use RISC V to replace the JVM. But a lot of software needs a JVM, and so we are, um, it's, it's being brought up. One of the problems with open source is that it can be hard to control it. And we saw this with Unix, where we had this wonderful operating system, but then 10 vendors took it, and they all evolved it in different directions. They ended up with the Tower of Babel, and that was one of the reasons why Windows was able to beat them all, because there were, there were all these different versions of Unix. Uh, do you have thoughts about what would keep that from happening with Risk Five? Because manufacturers would be tempted to try and take it and add their own proprietary thing on it to make it better. Well, it's two things. One is um, you can't say it's Risk Five compatible unless the foundation says so. Second one is um, we've already frozen. <laughs> Part of the reason we didn't come out until now is we now finally frozen the ISA spec. So the user level, basic stuff, you know, you can't change that and. Uh, so that's frozen. So they can add stuff, and that's, it's a goal to allow people to add stuff. But the challenge would be if some company came along and said, we're going to add some very important new instruction that you absolutely need to run the latest WhizBang app or set of apps, right? And we're going to like license, you know, encumber this in some way that requires you, know, you to lock into us. And the hope is the community just rejects that, uh, is the hope. Can you keep people from effectively patenting new instructions on the oh. Oh, Risk Five V2 architecture? So patents are a good, a good, good point to bring up. So we believe the ISA itself does not have anything that requires 
infringing a patent. Now, of course, once you build a microarchitecture, there's a gazillion microarchitecture patents you might infringe. However, a lot of the good ideas in out-of-order superscalar architecture were published 20 years ago or more. And so they are patent expired. So if you go re-implement a MIPS R20K, exactly the same, you know, you can read the published things how it happens. So a lot of the old patents on stuff is expired. Now I'm actually quite keen for one thing the foundation can do is provide an umbrella to protect people implementing RISC-V by documenting the prior art for all the stuff that's there. So to say this stuff is safe to use because of these, these things. And, um, and hopefully with enough 800 pound gorillas on our side, we can defend against the, the trolls um, is the hope. Yep. One of the things I like about Alpha is they attempted uh, really hard to define all the boundary cases, unpredictable, undefined, all these other behaviors that you take out which? Yes. So isn't, that, isn't there a tension between that and extensions? <laughs> um, no, I mean, each, each instruction is defined, and then extensions have to, the extension also has to define things. Like one, one of the things we spent some time on is, um, uh, the OS handling uh, extended user state from new extensions at the user level. And we provide, there's a um, part of the status register encodes the, um, like normally in a system you have a FPU enable bit because the OS doesn't want to save and restore the phone point registers if no, you're not actually using them. We kind of extended that a bit to have a, a four state model of off, clean, sorry, off, initial, clean, and dirty. And um, there's one set of bits for the FPU, one set of bits for anything else plus instructions that can save and restore, initialize an opaque object that's the, uh, the user context. Um, so uh, that's to insulate the OS from user extensions. Um, so they, set, you know, they can separate out. So you don't have to change the OS binary to add user extensions. Um, and and I'll code that, that isn't, that's defined to be save and restore, so you can save everything else and it will save it for you. Now, that won't actually be implemented as a hardware instruction in most platforms. It'll be implemented by the how. So you won't, but the OS only has to allocate space to say restore this, and in addition, that instruction may do internal microarchitectural optimizations you don't have to know about either. An example of doing this way back when was the vector vax I actually had this exact same structure to save and restore the vector unit state without the OS having to know about it. Um, so it's an old idea that, so one thing is there's all these great old ideas, and I'm quite happy to use these great old ideas, because you know, when they work, they work. You don't have to invent new things, yep. Load multiple, uh, which uh, you were just talking about saving, restoring vector state. Obviously, load multiple springs back to the, the save, restore primitive uh, wanting to be compact in the instruction stream to save space and bandwidth. Yeah, we argue about load multiple, store multiple. I think that's one of those things. That, and that we, form, that we tend to form the side of simplicity. Um, and that's what we've done so far. Yep. So do you have something, or do you plan to have something like instruction extension language to formalize or to simplify instruction extension? Well, yeah, so we have Chisel, and we already have, in fact, in classes, like right now, students are taking class with the Adrenome Accelerators to the Rocket Core. Um, they're doing it by manually writing the RTL in Chisel for those accelerators right now. But, you know, there be no reason you couldn't replicate the Tensolica style environment uh, if you wanted to. Um, so, yeah, and actually Tensilica is another interesting case study. So, you know, why would you do a 24-bit instruction length? There are good reasons to. It's a lot of good uh -huh. reasons not to. Yeah. I'll take some <laughs> money. So if you have 16 and 32, I don't think you need 24, is what I would say. Um, but, it, you know, it's a big barrier. And also, you know, wouldn't their life be much easier if they had a standard ISA to start from? And the real technology isn't a risk ISA. The real technology is, you know, tie and all this stuff. So they reinvented the wheel, you know, and that's a small company. You don't want that pain. Um. Early in your talk, you said, well, let's look at existing ISAs. There's x86, there's ARM, those are you know, too obvious. But this doesn't work and that doesn't work. So let's choose this instead, the risk thing. There must have been 20, 30 well-defined, well-documented, well-implemented architectures over the last yeah. 30 years. How hard did you examine all the others before jumping straight to the thing you've done 20 years ago? So you can do a first check. Is it open? No. That narrows it down to a handful. So about that handful. Why didn't they succeed? Is it because yeah. they're extensible? So actually, this is, I've been mean, having spent the weekend in, in Munich talking to the open cores guys. Um, um, and then being made aware of many more open cores, I've been looking around. I think the biggest single flaw is 
they're not really architects, surprisingly. The people, they, they, they're what I call stuck in 1940s, 1950s architecture, where the core is the ISA. And we're like a decade ahead. We're like in the 60s, you know, <laughs> with the IBM 360, where you separate the ISA from the implementation. I think that's one thing they haven't, you know, the, and also it's a lot of hobbyists, which is great. And we'll encourage those guys. But I think the biggest single drawback is most of those ISAs were designed as a single implementation that was documented. And they haven't thought of the separation. Yep. It seems to me if you're not going to use the Intel or the ARM instructions, that there's no particular advantage in using any one of these other has-beens because they have no market share, no particular penetration. There's no benefit from that. <laughs> you might as well do something that's better. Yeah, there's 851. Hardly on There's a bazillion different implementations. It has 8-bit instructions. You don't want that. I've coded on 56,000, which is a 24-bit yeah. machine. Okay, and. Um, and have some views with respect to uh, memory use efficiency and packing and unpacking ease. The, the load store architecture should allow loading and storing of 24-bit quantities and should be independent of address alignment. We already note that you've, uh, you support misaligned 32-bit yeah. instructions because of the pack packing. Right. Uh, why not carry that a little bit further and make your memory interface uh, alignment agnostic and be able to milk even more from your ability to pack and unpack as you go in and out of memory? Well, two things. So one thing is the memory system is byte addressable. That's kind of one of the, some parts of the software are very hard to change. That assumption is very hard to change, as the alpha guys found out, right? Do you have a load 24 bit or a load? No. So then. Um, load 40 bit? I'd say then that you're accessing memory in byte level quantities. If you want to add an extension that loads a, you know, n times whatever width vector and treats it, go ahead. You know, we, there's plenty of encoding space to add all that stuff. I think if for most general use, having all the powers of two, you're never more than the factor of two off. In fact, you're always less than a factor of two off the ideal size. And for most people have found over the years, that's kind of okay. And if you take your example, 24 bits, it's at most 50%. It's 50 to 30 percent better, and it's a, it's a big game. yeah. So if you, that's important to your application, go build the engine that uses those bits, um, and you won't be able to use a standard C compiler to generate code for it without breaking. Well, I, I see that code. same engine as being able to pack op codes using inline arguments. In other words, now you can use the program counter that you're calling from to fetch your immediate operands. So basically, all of the fancy packing would be supported in terms of being able to, to fetch some number of bytes into, into a register. There's a whole big gain in both the instruction and the battle. I don't care what people say 36 bits are here to stay. <laughs> well, and they had a point, you know. Uh, Len Bozak and Sam. I just advise you, don't listen to him. I don't think you will anyway. No. Because no matter where you put your point, it's always going to be, never, yeah. no matter where you put your interface, somebody's going to say, oh, let's just add this one little right. thing. It's oh, not that much more complicated. I can make the case. And you just go off the deep end. So you're yeah, so like, doing like, the right uh, thing. Yeah, we, we always fall on the side of, you know, I mean, Dave is part of the group, so he's very, keeps reminding us simplicity is king. And we have a one page that green card that Dave did while he was you know, laid out, I guess. <laughs> he had some spare time. Laid out a very nice one page summary of the instruction set. And it's very simple. Unlike the 5,000 page ARM ISA manual, we can actually describe the whole ISA on a single sheet of paper. Yeah, this, no one has yet tried to write an oh. ARM V8 book. <laughs> and I know why now. Yeah. It's, it's gigantic. Right. Oh, they're working. They just they're only five years into the project. <laughs> yes. So I mean, and so simplicity. Like if you think about security, for example, like the verification costs and security verification. Also, you want things. You always want things to be simple, but even more so. These I think it's just. Uh, and there's no reason. I, I, the quantifiable performance gain is in the noise when you consider in the background of all these other factors that affect the efficiency of a system. One thing you might look at is is the uh, formal method stuff that we've embedded, the SRI proof tools and uh, SMT solvers and SAT solvers into the blue spec compilation channel, chain. So we can actually do analysis of the uh, blue spec hardware well, ISA mm -hmm. and, and prove properties about it, for example. Uh, yeah, no, I think I, I am very excited that people want to build a formal model and then you first need to spec. Yeah. And then that will enable tools like this, so you could have formally verified implementations. I mean, that, that has been done a few times before. Yeah. Um, it will be good to have that. I think a lot of last time we tried it, we were 40 years ahead of the, of the things. Right now, now I think it's done. It's yeah. possible. Yeah.
The nice thing is that if there's only one ISA, you don't have to redo it all the time. Right? Just, yeah. so. so you said we said no to various ideas. Yeah. Uh, did you document those? So you if you read the ISA manual, there's an extensive rationale behind our choices. There's a lot of, we, there's a lot of, we spend a lot of time writing why we didn't do certain things. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's it's incredibly important, I mean, both for sort of reading between the lines and understanding what actually did happen, but also yeah. for uh, saving energy when somebody comes along and suggests Well, them. there's a master's thesis on the compressed instructions, and that corresponded with the chap who wrote that thesis, and he says, you're one of the few people who's read the thesis. I mean... Yeah, yeah one thing, you know, every, uh, as many of you who are innovators know, but you have an idea, everybody knows that it's bad without having understood it at all. And there's a, people are good at throwing tomatoes without understanding the thing. So, but we took care, we can, I, I R, right, I RTFM, like we wrote, we wrote it all down. Once you've read it, then, you know, please come talk to us and, you know, you might disagree with us. Yeah, but the sections of the manual have, what, what do you call it? Commentary. Yeah. Commentary. Yeah. And so, Rational. when you get to, like, lodestar multiple, oh, yeah. there's a discussion <laughs> about all the issues. And, right. All well, the things we considered. And so, yeah. Um, I mean, do listen to him, but like uh, the... The memory model, the, the AMO ordering bits arose after people have pointed out, well, we should have better support than the fence instruction. The fence instruction would have been adequate for supporting the language models. But given that we're adding the AMOs as an extension and that it seemed very easy to add these things, that, that was added on the basis of feedback from outside about people who are implementers of those languages telling us, you know, you need to think about this a bit more than you have. I mean, what you have is okay, but this would be better. There's some things we left out that people complain about. I think um, one that we hear a lot about is overflow, uh, checking for overflow. It turns out one of the good things in the ISA is, is merge branch compares and the branch themselves. And you'll see that MIPS has done that now, even more so. They used to have just register quality. I think that's, so what might be interesting to write is, what do people have, the convergence of all the risk ISAs are a new set of things that are different from maybe the original risk ISAs. So we could probably write that. Um, but because we, added the compares into the branches, we can do unsigned interflow over check in a single branch after the, you know, before the add even. So, or after the add. So a lot, the only one that we can't handle cleanly is a signed integer add overflow. And that takes a few instructions. But, you know, how many languages need that? You know, there are some in languages, popular ones that need it. That's the one thing, you know, that's one thing that comes up that maybe, and we decided to err on the side of simplicity because it is a slightly awkward branch to implement. Yep. There's a premise here that simplicity is good and quick yeah. design is good and quick design cycle is good and even better if six grad students can do it in a semester and so forth. Yep. Um, as a user of a computer system, why do I care how, how much trouble the manufacturer do? Why do I care if Intel put 5,000 man years into getting a processor out if the result is something that in some way is more useful to me? A couple of reasons. One is you paid for it. You pay for those engineers. If you're a server, like, why do the data center guys want to do something else on Intel? Have you bought, have you looked at the price of a server chip from Intel? Um, the other thing is security. How likely is this thing to actually work? Um, and also understanding it. Like, if you're a compiler author, A, 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 okay. But, but again, as a user, my premise is, as somebody that wants to go out and buy a system, I'm not a compiler writer. Sure. I, the, uh... But no, so you, right, as an end user, you just can't, so, but look, you know, think about how many more IoT devices will be out there if they're not all waiting to license stuff from ARM. I think that we're at a change point in the industry where we're going away from chips to SOCs. Mm -hmm. And so that is a fundamental change where people can, cust you're not just buying a chip from Intel and they're making right. 100 million of them and it doesn't cost you anything. Now that people, Lots of companies designing SOCs, that will be real cost. Verification costs will be real cost. And it'll affect the cost of these SOCs. And it's a you need to have a different set of requirements for SOC construction sets. Maybe a, maybe a more refined answer to you paying for it is that um, Intel's model lies on this sort of business economy class, you know, servers and everything else. But to pay for the core development, they charge the server guys a lot of money. Um, and also they don't get to because it's such a complex core, it's hard to build an SOC around it. Like let somebody else build an SOC around it. So you're limited by what Intel thinks are good SOCs right now. Um, so, you, you know, like Apple, for example, you know, why do they get such battery life? They integrate a lot of stuff. They do the whole the vertical integration. They couldn't do that with, well, they might be able to persuade Intel now. Uh, they want to use that, but it's too late. That ship sailed for Intel. So, 
you know, there's, you do care, even if you, you do care because you pick these other products that don't have x86 in now, for example. Those guys at Intel and ARM just wake up one morning and say, oh, you know what we forgot to do? We forgot to make our eyes stay open, you know. It's like, you know, they wake up, oh, yeah, we'll go do that right now, you know. Tax their underlings to go and make it open to everybody. They will actively go and sue you if you try and do an implementation of, you know, an Intel Core or an ARM Core or an IBM Power or any of these other ISAs, right? They'll aggressively go after anybody trying to do an implementation and to that standard. So it's not that they just forgot to do this, right? They, they go out there and they get people who try and do this. Um, now, the other reason, why is it proprietary? Is it because these guys develop all the software for you as well? No. I mean, most of the software for an ISA isn't written by the companies who, shall, who sell parts for that ISA. It's done by other people. Like all the developers out there do all that software development, right? Um, and it's not because these are great ISAs. Right, you know, like these are the only people who could ever come up with something as wonderful as their creations, like x86, um, v 7 v 8 right? It's, you know, is, is that why we chose those ISAs, because they're so great? Um, they're just not the most, the, the best ISA in the world. If you wanted to do an ISA, you would not pick one of those, right? It's just what's out there, what they got, right? So they're not the wonderful ISAs either. One other piece of FUD we hear from, you know, people who are promoting the licensed ISAs, well, you know, our company will guarantee compatibility for you, make sure the hardware runs stuff. Um, ISA is one of the easiest things to verify compared to other industry standards like Wi-Fi, you know, LTE, this other stuff. This is like trivial, right? Making sure ISAs are compatible. It's an important thing. You want to have it be there. It's not anywhere near difficult enough to require billions of dollar investment in a company to do this, right? You, know, you could have small labs certifying ISA compatibility. It's much simpler than lots of other things to which the industry has open interfaces and has people verifying compatibility and things work together, okay? So there's no technical reason why I say shouldn't be free and open. It's purely historical and business reasons why these things have been locked up. Um, another big issue, and one that impacts us as researchers, is those proprietary ISAs are not guaranteed to last. Some of you may remember a pretty large computer company called Digital Equipment Corporation, right? And they had some pretty important ISAs at one point, VAX and Alpha. They're both gone, right? If you built all that software, you spent the billions shooting your stuff for their ISAs, and for some bad business decision at that company, the company goes under. What do you do with your software? Well, you move it to a different ISA. That's a big cost. And as researchers, I know that a lot of researchers, for example, built research infrastructure around the digital alpha ISAs, kind of relatively nice and clean. That's all gone, and what's worse is you cannot choose to keep it going because there's probably some small IP holding firm that has the stuff and will go after you because it was proprietary and it seemed to be worth something, right? So um, the proprietary ISA is a guarantee. I guarantee that Intel x86 will not be around indefinitely. At some point, it will be replaced, right? Same with ARM, right? Every ISA will die <laughs> eventually. Um, so they're not guaranteed to last. So that's another thing. And you can't choose to maintain them afterwards necessarily if they've been proprietary. Um, so let's say we actually had a viable freely open ISA, what would the benefits be? Well, um, we believe one of the big things would just be greater innovation from uh, many, many core designers. So you've had a standard, companies could compete on the quality of their implementation rather than the, aggress rather than the aggressiveness of their lawyers, right? They could actually compete on the quality of what they built. And um, we think that would allow many, many core designs. It would also support open source core designs. Right now, you know, you cannot, even if you do all the work yourself, put an ARM uh, V7, V8 core out there, and have other people look at it and try to improve it. That's just not allowed. You'll, be, you'll get takedown notice straight away. Okay. Um, another thing that um, some entities find uh, a little discomforting about buying proprietary ISA implementations is they don't trust the countries that those companies work in uh, to produce things that don't have trapdoors in. So if you're, you know, the Chinese government, the Indian government, African government. Hey, hi, I'm uh, Chris Trosanovich. I'm uh, one of the people who's been working on RISC V. I should give a shout out to all the, the major contributors, especially Andrew Waterman and Jens Lee, two of our grad students who uh, drove a lot of this, and Dave Patterson, who's in the audience, who's been working with me on this as well. But there's a whole host of characters who have been helping with RISC V in the Aspire Lab. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, I start with a little aside here, which is uh, my first computer. Um, this is a picture of my first computer. Now in the UK, 
I ask people to guess what this is. I'll ask here. I don't expect anybody to know this. Um, no, this was actually an acorn atom. So it came out before the BBC Micro. There's a 6502 base machine. And there's two reasons I'm telling you about this machine. Um, one is that it was open source. And you bought the computer, you got the schematics. You knew exactly what was in there, made it very easy to program it, attach stuff to it, um, play with it. Um, the second reason, it's made by Acorn. And people have tried to cast Risk V versus ARM as David versus Goliath. I find that pretty funny. The ARM guys think it's funny, too, because they think they're David fighting the other Goliath, Intel. Um, but um, really, I just want to say a few things about ARM. This is kind of a disclaimer that you know, they're a great company. Um, they produce, if they produce the IP you need, um, and if you can work out a license agreement with them in time, um, then you'd be crazy not to use ARM. But many projects don't fit into the above. And some people are just crazy. Um, so what is an ISA? Well, the first thing I should say about ISAs is they don't matter at all. right? ISAs are really, really unimportant in the grand scheme of things. And by that, I mean, if you look at um, the performance and efficiency of a system, um, most of it's due to other stuff, like the algorithm you use. Much bigger weight on how well a system performs than anything about the instruction set. How you code it, um, the compiler you use. There is a little effect from the ISA, maybe. Um, but the microarchitecture, the core design, the memory hierarchy, the circuit design, how good your design is at building these components, the physical design, how well did you do floor planning, um, the fabrication you use to build this thing, right? So Intel's got amazing fabrication technology. So in some sense, ISAs don't really matter if you look at performance energy efficiency, right? Um, and this is what some people wonder about. Why do we care about the ISA anymore? Because of all these other factors. But the reason that ISAs do matter is that um, it's the most important interface in a computer system. It's where hardware meets software. Okay? And um, there's a massive cost to port and tune all the ISA dependent parts of a software stack. Um, just one small example, ARM v8 still doesn't have a very effective JVM. Right? So, um, and as well as that, there's all the stuff you don't expect, like the large cost of port and tune and quality assure, assure all the stuff that's supposed to be ISA independent. But turns out it isn't because all the other stuff usually has bugs in that are ISA dependent on that port. So there's a lot of work to bring everything over to a new ISA. Okay. So given that, um, if the choice of ISA doesn't have much impact on the end system's energy performance, and it costs a lot to use different ones, why is there more than one, right? Makes no sense that the industry has more than one ISA, right? So why is that, okay? Um, so we say no reason. There should be one ISA, should be free and open, should be standard just like Ethernet, right? Just standard where you connect parts of the industry together, the hardware guys, the software guys. Um, so so why, is, why are we in this situation where there are multiple different ISAs? Well, it's basically historical and business reason. There's no technical reason for the lack of a free and open ISA. Um, it's not an error of omission. It's not like the, I don't know if you'd want to trust the UK or the US companies to give you a core that didn't have trapdoors in. And this is a real issue. And you know, revelations the last few years, you know, stuff goes on that you wouldn't imagine actually went on. And so these are not just the tinfoil hat brigade. These are serious people and other governments worrying about trapdoors in these designs. Um, now, cost of licensing these is actually probably one of the minor issues. There is a, if you actually negotiate a deal, the cost is not burdensome, but the time to negotiate a deal and some of the upfront costs matter. And so if you're smart startups and the newest, hottest thing here at Stanford, you're all you know, money-grubbing capitalists. You know, that's the Berkeley view anyway. So you have all your startup ideas, you want to get ideas out there quickly. Um, the time to negotiate the agreement and the upfront money may stop you doing it. It'd be nice to have something you can quickly use without thinking about it to get your idea off the ground. Because usually that's not a critical component in your grand idea. You just need a core that kind of runs all the software. right? Um, and for us, the original motivation was to make architecture education and research more real. So I actually have real things that you know, we could fabricate, we could run code on, we could port stacks to, and make it more real than um, sort of toy simulators that kind of only just model uh, one of these hardware things. And also, if we invest all this work in our you know, infrastructure, we don't want it to disappear when the company goes under, like, like what happened with DEC. Okay. Um, so we all agree we need a free and open ISA. So which one are we going to use? Um, 
So what style of ISA? Well, if the ISA doesn't really matter too much in terms of end system energy performance, as implementers, you want to pick one that's easy to implement, right? There's no reason to go do something like an x86. You'd want to do something relatively simple. And, you know, Seymour Cray's load store designs, later refined into the risk, those seem like a great choice. Those design ideas have survived many generations of technology and seem like a, uh, a sensible place uh, to, you know, put your stake in the ground. And so this looks like what, you know, risk style ISA seems to be the ISA you want to build to make it open standard, right? So it should be a risk style ISA. Now, we're not the first people to think about doing a free and open risk style ISA. There's been a bunch of others. Um, so one, to give us credit, Spark V8, um, Sun Micro 